Hello, and welcome to Fireside with the VC. My name is Andrew Romans, and it is a great honor, and I would even say historic event, that we've got Pitch Johnson on the podcast on the podcast today. So, Pitch, thank you so much for joining us today. Very glad to be here and have a chance to tell some stories. Absolutely, and I can't wait to get into them. So, for those of you of those of you who don't know, Pitch Johnson, now ninety two years old is one of the true founding fathers of the venture capital industry. In 1962, Pitch and Bill Draper founded Draper Johnson together, which went on to get acquired, and then Pitch started a 60-year career in the venture capital game, where he's made over 250 investments. Some of the investments he made are just absolutely historic, such as Amgen, which I believe is valued at around $150 billion today, companies that define the computer industry, such as Tandem Computer, and many, many others, where often VCs are in a rush to exit their exit ahead of their next fundraise and wind up a fund in 10 or 12 years. Pitch, I believe, has set records of being on the board of directors for 30 plus years at some of these companies. Um, so Pitch, once again, and I'll say further, Pitch was on a director of the National Venture Capital Association for many years, was the chairman of the San Francisco Opera. And, and uh, a lot of people went to Stanford, but I believe your days at Stanford influenced you quite a bit in how you audited classes later and found your way into biotech. But um, undergraduate in um, Stanford and MBA from what I guess was the only real MBA at the time, Harvard Business, Harvard Business School. So again, Pitch, thank you again for gracing us with your time. I'm really glad to have a chance to do this. Well, great. So, Pitch, maybe 60 years is a unique perspective um, of being in the industry. Maybe, I know with asset management, we'll talk about what you're doing today, but what are some of the big changes you've seen in the industry from the ethos to how it works from 60 years ago or nearly 60 years ago to what you see happening today in Sand Hill Road and around the world? Well, I must say that it was small, there was only a few people in it, and we thought our job, because it wasn't being done by anybody, really, but we, and that, that's not true. It had been done by some wealthy families back east. But uh, Bill uh, uh, went to work for his father in a Pioneer Venture Fund in 1959, and we started Draper and Johnson in 62. So Bill had an idea of um, what the business was, and so we didn't start off with no knowledge. So the, the, the met, I met Bill Draper after I, 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 I will disagree with you that, the, that Harvard Business School was not the only business school. Stanford had a pretty good business school too. Okay. And uh, I got into it and I didn't get in Harvard. So I, I, after I ran a, a national track meet in near Washington, I flew up to Boston and um, said that I'm just the kind of guy you, they said that you would be, I, I didn't really uh, do what they thought was necessary of saying what part of business I wanted to be in. I said, I don't even understand business. And I, I want to go to business school to learn about business itself. And I don't have a plan, a career plan right now that I can tell you. And that in a letter from my dean, determined, very famous dean, uh, I think they, they eventually let me in because the, the admissions director was willing to see me when I learned that visit. And he, uh, when I did finally get in, um, I went to see him and said, thank you. He said, do me a favor. Don't tell everybody on earth you pounded on my desk and we let you in. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so anyway, um, Bill Draper was in the military at that point. This was before, the, just when the Korean War was started. And so I, 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 um, I enjoyed my time there. I learned a lot about business. I certainly met some good friends, lifetime friends. But um, I got out in 52, and I had gotten a deferment from the draft. So in 52, I went in the Air Force as an aircraft maintenance officer because the, um, the Air Force came around to Harvard Business School and offered, oh, 60 of us, I think, commissions. And I took one. I went to work for Inland Steel Company in the steel mills, and I won't, what a, what a good experience though for somebody from Palo Alto 
to go to work in a steel mill. It's we have very little idea what those heavy duty, dirty jobs are. And I worked shifts for six, five years. And so um, I, it was a great time. And then Bill Draper, I moved into a company house near any Chicago. Bill Draper moved in with, not with me, but near us. Right. We got to know Bill and Phyllis early on within a, a few weeks. And the Bill was in a training program downtown. So, so he went downtown every day and I went to the mill and we just became good friends. Almost automatically, we had the same ideals, we had the same standards, and, and we got to talking. And um, I just, um, I just uh, want to say one thing that happened to me there was so important. My first day in, on the job, the superintendent of my department, which is called number three, number two open hearts, superintendent is a big deal. I won't go into it, but he's the major boss of a section of the mill. So he um, brought me into his office and said, Pitch, welcome to number two open hearts. Uh, we've had college kids here before. <laughs> and, uh, so I said, oh, well, I'm, I, did, I didn't say much. In it. Then he said, we're going to teach you how to make steel, but I'm not going to be the one that does that. It's going to be those men on the floor. So I want you to spend the next few next amount of time getting to know those guys. If they, if you get along with them, they'll show you their trade. If you don't, they'll make it harder. So I, I now, so get to know the people turned out to be a very valuable lesson for me. I've applied it many times. The first thing you, you're involved in something new, get to know the people. I, that was a valuable, valuable lesson because I was a super efficient. MBA and I didn't re I didn't think about that till I was told to do that. Sure. And to shorten this story down, uh, Bill um, Draper was in a company house and he was in a training program down to, and we became good friends. And then in 1959, this all started in um, well in 1954, and then Bill in 1959, left Inland Steel and left his, his job as a salesman to go join his father back in Palo Alto in a pioneer venture firm called Draper, Gaither, and Anderson. It was one of the very earliest venture firms before, as you would guess, before Draper and Johnson. So then in 1960, uh, I, I, we traveled out here right away to introduce Bill to my friends because I was from here and I wanted them to meet my friends. And we did that. Then in 1961, we came out for what we always call the big game around here. Okay. And uh, we uh, stayed with the Drapers and went to the game. And at that, during that time, on Bill's kitchen table, we cooked up the idea of having our own venture fund. And so <laughs> uh, Bill was very loyal to his father, and, but he wanted to get on his own. Because the Draper Gift International was a a big, bigger venture fund with lots of guys there. So we cooked up the idea of Draper and Johnson, and we decided we'd start at the next, um, we st we'd start as soon as we could. And so we went to, I went back to Washington to get a license for something called a small business investment company. So without going into all the details, I borrowed a little money, he borrowed a little money, and we scraped together enough to start this, um, this company, and um, then we, we leveraged our own capital with capital from the government, and so we built a, a company called Draper and Johnson Investment Company. And it was, it started with, it was an SBIC, and we did, we made some pretty good deals. We, we went, went around the neighborhood, looked for companies with passable, with promising names, and, uh, and we uh, would go in and knock on the door, and sort of say, do you want any money today? We didn't exactly put it that way, but people always let you in. It was just amazing when you said you had capital to offer the, <laughs> the receptionist or the guy who always took you to the boss quickly. <laughs> and that, that was a good way to get in. And, and Pitch, then, I, think, um, I think you once told me you guys lease some cars and you're literally driving around, driving by looking for a name in Palo Alto that sounded high tech. And, and, and then the receptionist would say, what is venture capital? 
So what is the heart of the Silicon Valley? You had to explain that to the receptionist to source. You had to explain it to the boss too. He didn't know. He knew people invested in companies, but the boss was very often a gentleman, almost all men, in fact, all men to start with, who had started companies on their own and didn't have outside capital. But many of them were growing. And it turned out we never actually made a deal from that, but we sure met a lot of people and we met people who met people. And so Bill and I uh, had some uh, chances to invest in several companies, most of which worked out, not all, of course. And then um, in 1965, Sutter Hill Ventures was started and they, we had a really good portfolio, but they paid us a good price for our portfolio. And so uh, the, the deal was, I, would, I wanted to run a company, not, I wanted to be a player, not a coach. So uh, Bill and I agreed to this deal with Sutter Hill. They bought our portfolio for a good price. It was able to, we were able to pay off all our debts to the SBIC. And I had a couple hundred thousand bucks then, which I never had had before. And so I started looking for a company to buy, but all I, I began to find deals to do on my own. Right. And, and so sometimes I did a couple of things with Sutter, I guess one or two deals with Sutter Hill, but basically I did things on my own until, uh, until till now, <laughs> all right. So um, we had a good experience. Bill began to run Sutter Hill, and he, however, after a few years, did a good job with it. And a guy named Paul Wise, he and he they sort of fund it, found it. But Bill had a chance to go to Washington. A, a number of a couple of jobs. One was the Export Import Bank because mm -hmm. he was a friend from Yale days of, of President George H. W. Bush. So Bush heard about him and so offered him that. Bill uh, wanted to do that public service and that's what he did. So I never did find a deal to buy, but I kept running into investments on purpose, I would say, and then became a private venture capitalist and then I formed a, a family SBIC, a partnership with my kids and um, Kathy and me, my wife with Kathy and me. And so that became the entity in which we did deals. And I, I formed that because I, I saw Amgen as a very, very likely success. I, I was right for once, but Bill Bowes actually brought the idea to me who was a very good friend from Stanford and Harvard Business School. And so Bill Bowes got me involved in Amgen by offering me a chance to invest in it very early. And they called me a founder down there, but if it was really a founder of venture, it was really Bill Bowes. And Bill's believing I could help and asking me to join it was a major event in my life. And so my family partnership, uh, Went with it, and we still have a Van Gen stock. Luckily, and, and pitch, don't you? Didn't you um, take some classes at uh, Stanford that you audited around biotech? So you were, it was kind of happening back then. And I think wasn't one of your roommates at some point, or one of your good friends was uh, founder of uh, Genentech or something, and you didn't want to invest. Well, what happened was, well, yeah, uh, what happened there? The story is in a little different order. So in 1964, I took a course in molecular biology, which I didn't know anything about. I'm a mechanical engineer. And I, I mean, I read about it, I knew about it. And this course uh, uh, was very meaningful to me because it taught me that you could take a, a non-human um, organisms and put human organisms uh, in them and they could make human hormones. It doesn't sound like much now, but it was obvious that so it didn't have to be very bright to say that, boy, this could be good if it can work. <laughs> so that, that, that was a result of, uh, and so, so when, um, at some point along in there, I needed somebody to work with me. So I hired Brooke, Brooke Byers out of an unrelated business and Brooke Byers, um, 
worked for me for oh, about I think about five years, and at some point um, we did a deal with um, Tom Perkins called mm -hmm. Tandem. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So Bill, um, so Brooke was the one who checked out the Tandem deal, suggested that we do it, and then he uh, he wanted to start a, a venture fund with outside money. And I wanted to be a private venture capitalist, so with he went to joined uh, Kleiner Perkins, then became Caulfield and Byers, and so he went mm -hmm. to work basically as a partner for Tom Perkins. And um, so the funny part of this is that Tom Perkins uh, uh, said to me when he called me about looking at uh, at it, he said. I, I really want to. I like to get a name venture capitalist involved in this. Here's Tom Perkins saying that to me. Right, I, right, I right. These days about that, but uh, but anyway, but Brooke went down and looked at it. Did a good job, and, and we did make an investment in tandem computers, which uh, uh, Tom Perkins had really formed. Uh, the idea of it came out of Hewlett Packard. Then uh, Brooke then left. So I didn't want to form a venture company, raise money and all that stuff. I wanted to be a private, private. So Brooke joined Tom in, well, I don't remember exactly. I'd say 1967, about then. And and um, he was with me five years. So, but he, um, his roommate uh, was the founder of Genentech. So when we heard about right. Genentech, uh, he said he didn't want to get involved in it because his, his roommate was the head of it. And he said, so I said, uh, luckily, but dumbly, I said, okay. But it turned out that because I did that, even though it sounded like a mistake at the time, when Bill Bowles came up with the idea of doing Amgen, then I was, I was free to do that. I had no ties with, it, with um, uh, uh, Genetic. Right. Well, that's the roommate uh, story, but I, he, it wasn't my roommate. It was the guy who worked for me at the time. Okay, yeah, that makes sense with y y you guys, right, right, right. And um, so, tell me, with, with with when you say a private venture capitalist, this means that you were not investing other people's money. I think at some point you maybe philanthropically were investing Stanford endowment money, though. Isn't that right? Well, so at some point we decided to, uh, I decided, to, to, and a guy named, a very able guy named Craig Taylor came to work to me basically to take, to take Brooks place. And he and I decided to raise a little outside money. So we had, um, uh, we started, uh, uh, we called it Asset Management Ventures, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And so Craig, became a partner of it. And then we raised money from Stanford, from, um, oh, from a couple of three universities, and um, uh, from uh, just some individuals actually. And we raised about, see how much was that? I think about, about, about the 30, 40 million. So mm -hmm. we had, it was a nice little fund and then uh, later on, so when uh, my uh, I stuck around with deals a little bit too long. So later on, Craig Taylor is a good friend of mine now. Said I had to unlearn something from you after I left. He and some other guys left to form their own venture fund with raise a lot of money. And so what I he said I, what I had to unlearn was sticking with the deal too long. At some point you got to cut the, cut the rope and then get on your own. But I always felt that not necessarily putting in more money, but it's more time and working with the management, you can make a success out of some of these companies. And of course, um, there's, there's a certain amount of truth to that. There is, but he, look, I mean, uh, Craig is right. At some point, you, you say, okay, that's enough of this. But I couldn't stand the idea of failing, so I stuck with things too long. And um, there's a company called Viasite. I'm still involved with it. I got involved, in, not in those days, but shortly afterwards. And Viasite, by the way, has a wonderful 
idea to cure uh, uh, type 1 diabetes by building uh, uh, organisms which can make make insulin introduced into the body. That That's not worth all the detail. But Viacite is now is getting very close to getting their products. It's been financed well uh, by uh, some venture funds. And um, it's, um, I mean, it's stuck with it in one form or the other a long time. But I think in the end, it's going to work out. I wouldn't describe exactly a high IRR, but it will succeed in them. And, and one of the things that we did, uh, just about everybody, was we formed companies with the thought of building a company and getting rewarded for that by, by making money. We didn't go into it directly to make money. That was a very much different from today when, when it's a financial business. Not, not so much, uh, the, they call it venture capital. There's still, there's still plenty of venture capitalists who are building companies from the beginning. But most of what they call venture capital now, and there's nothing wrong with it or anything improper, but they're managing billions of dollars and they got to make big investments and they got to turn them over in a few years time. Right. That, nothing to do with the business I was in. But I will say, I don't want to sound righteous, but we were, we were building companies was the reason we were there because the way there's, there wasn't anybody else with a different example. And then making money when the company succeeded and became valuable. And that's a big difference between now. There's some people doing that. We're, I'm still doing that in a minor way, but our company, Anisette Management Ventures, it's backed by other people as well. But my own family office has done a couple of deals with a couple of young entrepreneurial women. And, uh, and, and, and we, I'm still on some boards that, that have been on for a while. But the, the fundamental nature of the business has changed from building companies and getting rewarded. And I don't, I don't want to put aside the getting rewarded. We love that part to now going directly after making money. And right. there's nothing wrong with it. It's legal. It's, there's a very high degree of integrity in terms of truthfulness and openness among just it's still that part of the business is carried on, except by these big multi-billion dollar guys and, and women, by the way, sure. In, in the business in a major way. Um, so I would say something like this. We, we really worked hard to, to get investors, put a million or two in the business entirely in 1965. And then it, uh, you go by the decades, we haven't got time to go through it all. It became tens of millions, eventually it became hundreds of millions, it became billions, <laughs> and then finally tens of billions. And now we had years of over a hundred billion investment and that it all happened over about 20 years time. And it, um, it, what, what's called venture capital now is not what I d called it then. Now, there's, some, there's a few companies of, of 50, 100 million size, which is tiny now, who uh, do invest in young companies, build them up, and then, then they can go to the big companies and get some more investment. But the, but the thing is, that these little companies can get lots of money now. They can get, instead of scraping their way by, they they can get $100 million or $200 million from the big guys and, and not go through that valley of death thing we used to talk about. Sure. They run out of money. Uh, but but it's a, it's a, I think what we define as venture capital now is completely different was how it was defined then. The National Venture Capital Association uh, has done a good job of keeping touch with different levels of venture capital and having members. And they work with the government on regulations. They uh, have a almost daily newsletter that comes out and does things, I mean, does information. So they, they've been an important force in building the venture capital business. They've also helped change the definition of what venture capital is to, to old timers like me. Yeah, I think that um, there's been a lot of change where even after the dot-com crash of 2000, 2001, 
um, the IPO market closed and these companies would stay private much longer and there'd be these big checks coming in from people that were really like Fidelity or Carl Icahn that were investing after an IPO were now investing before the IPO and this is misunderstood as one grouping of what is venture capital. When in reality, this growth funding where you have liquidity and exits for founders and early investors in the secondary market should be viewed differently than this early stage passion investing. Well, at first, you know, nobody heard of venture capital. capital. And as I said, you had to explain what it was and, and uh, what you were doing. But it, the, the people with the money deals decided they'd like to call it venture capital too. I'm not quite sure why they just didn't call it private equity to start with. Right. But, but venture capital, and of course, young companies are started by these big guys and with lots of money. And they're trying to build up value, as I say, legitimately, in, in, in almost every case, honestly and decently. But they do, uh, the founders of these companies get used to having a hundred or two hundred billion dollars in some cases. However, there are a bunch of guys, mostly guys, but a bunch of firms who um, start in with uh, 40 or 50 million, even less, and get companies going and guide them. And you, there were three parts of it. One was providing the money. The second part was inviting business advice. And the third part, not often mentioned, was uh, keeping them enthusiastic, giving a pat on the bottom when they needed it, pepping them up when they get discouraged. And, um, and, and there's a ba bad moment in almost all firms at some point when the, uh, when, the, when the founder or the founding group needs to hear from somebody, we believe in you, keep going, don't get discouraged, that kind of stuff. And that's an important part of the business, at least it was in my era. And, and the guys who did a good job of that, among them were Tom Perkins, by the way, who was good at that. And um, Brooke Byers became strong at, that, at helping companies too. So those three elements of venture capital still remain for the people starting companies. And there's still a few venture capital firms are fundamentally starting young companies with modest amounts of capital and working with them and kept the business the same. But the main thing now is the big guys with billions of dollars, uh, putting lots of money into not only startups, but going into companies that have been running a few years and giving them plenty of money for growth. And growth has been more important than profitability. So right. Companies build big values not on profitability, which used to be the end point, but um, in, in, in having value because of sales or even uh, hope for sales sometimes. Um, so I, 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 there's nothing, I just wish they didn't call it venture capital because it, it, to me, it isn't the same thing, but sure. we call it what it is and, and they can call it if they want to. I just would prefer the word private equity for what they're doing. Yeah, I think that for them, if they're coming in close to a liquidity event, moving a large amount of money, getting a 20% on even a 1.5x for them, coupled with the management fee is, is what's happening there. Um, it's not the same if you explain to a Wall Street guy, I might not get a bonus until I do all this work, return all this money and go for years without a bonus. The guy who's really in it for the money would not understand that venture capital <laughs> passion play. He's like, you went for how long without a bonus? That's insanity, you know, but, but it, it is changing. And so pitch, what is your perspective on the two and 20 kind of 10 year structure? Do you think that we're going to see more evergreen venture capital funds that allow fund managers to stay on a board for 30 years like you, or do you think it's uh, healthy that these guys are forced to raise a new fund every three years and well, Sutter put points Hill, on the board? Sutter Hill has become an evergreen fund. It's doing a great job. It's had some great deals, and they've made a lot of money for their investors, but their investors stick with them. They don't, they don't change investors. They, people can sell out, but you, they don't raise money as such. Uh, they, they have a, a fixed, not fixed, but they have a fixed, they have a number of investors and Thunder Hill is the main one I know of, and that doesn't necessarily mean much. Right. It's been the one that's a, a, a uh, 
evergreen fund, I guess I would call it. Right. I mean, well, whether it's evergreen or if they're returning stock or exit consideration to LPs in relatively short periods of time compared to your independent, do you think venture capital, and I know you've advised after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you've advised funds in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And so venture capital hasn't taken off in other parts of the world or the big balance sheet buyers are not necessarily concentrated to dovetail with the VCs. Do you in think- 1990, yeah. Bill Draper called me up from his job as head of the United Nations Development Program. He said, I want you, would you go on a trip with me to Eastern Europe and visit these companies and help them understand what private, equi- what private enterprise is and, and how they can raise money. I, I, was, I was thrilled with the opportunity to do that. So I, I couldn't go to the Polish part, but I went to uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, then Yugoslavia, and um, with Bill, and uh, Bill's wife happened to be on the trip, which is great because we're good friends, <laughs> and, uh, and his European guy. And I met the presidents of practically all those countries during the course of the visit. And, and I would explain to them how capitalism works, how they could get involved in it. And um, then because of that, when I got home, I eventually invested in a fund sep- separately, which happened to be in Poland, although I didn't visit Poland. Right. I did later, of course. And then I got involved in a Polish fund a fund in Romania and Bulgaria, both starting in Romania, and a fund in Russia, which was unrelated to them, but I, I, I got met some people from Russia. And so I, I involved in several venture funds there, and I traveled to Eastern Europe a lot, and did well, it did well, well, it wasn't great, but it did fine. And um, so I'm pretty familiar with Eastern Europe until the COVID, uh, crisis came along and it was difficult to travel. I went there about once a year to visit funds. I got involved in a fund in Norway as well with the, uh, some guys that I met. So I had a lot, a lot of um, investments in Europe, which I still have some of, but we, we liquidated the Polish fund is right now, as a matter of fact, and pretty successful without being a, a barn burner. And um, the Russian fund is, 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 is now li- getting liquid. So that's getting over with. The, um, the fund in Romania and Bulgaria, essentially we, sh- sh- well, we, I, I withdrew from it list and just left the money in there, not doing much. It's just, it's just, it's not at all strong, but there was nothing went broke. I'll say that for it. Um, Although I, I think this time, time and energy and, and capital been, been put into the American markets by me at the same time, I had done better economically, right. but I would, by no means have had the interest or the influence I had on at least some countries and how they shaped themselves into modern industrial capitalistic countries. I'm not yeah. saying I was key to that, but I had an, I had an influence over by meeting all those presidents of countries, uh, I, I know I introduced a lot of concepts that have been used. That's great, that's great. And so what's your perspective of, are we at the very beginning of the story of venture capital as a percentage of economies in state of California versus some people say there's too much money chasing too few deals or there's not enough money or like what percentage of Japanese top of the class graduates go into entrepreneurship, it's still low compared to, you know, the U.S. and Europe is really waking up. Where do you think we are as far as reaching a steady state of the role of venture-backed entrepreneurship in U.S. versus some of these other parts of the world? What, what, uh, this is a naive statement, but how we'll keep on building these big multi-billion dollar values for companies based on promises and based on future sales, and based on sales, and not on earnings, I have trouble understanding how that could last forever. Sure. But, it, it, but the, the right now, these values are being built up by uh, people 
who run big funds, put big money in. And I think, I don't think you're a big come, come up as will happen and where the whole thing's going to crash. But I think what people will, the, the, the return on investment will, will get lower. And the reason it went so high was people were making good money in venture capital. Money came in, money came on top of that. And then eventually there'll be some balance between rate of return on investment and the opportunities that are held. But it's far different than I thought it would be, and it's going to stay different to, from that. But it, there will be some point when the, when the internal rate of return from venture capital will not be so much greater than rate of returns on other things. But right now it is, and there's money pouring in, even as we, even now in this, right in the middle of the COVID crisis. Yeah, I think we've seen companies that have negative unit economics. So for every, you know, $5 million of sales, they threw $10 million to generate that sales. And that these companies raise money from investors until investors are not willing to put money in. And then they view an IPO on the NASDAQ as their only alternative. And so that's bad. Whereas you have these other companies that have very profitable unit economics that are high growth, high profitable, make sense in a discounted cash flow sense, and then those get out. So we, I, think, I think right now we're witnessing both and these mega, mega funds make the loss making IPO, you know, a possibility when there's no other alternative, you know, sadly. Um, Pitch, maybe you, you've got a great story of um, some of the rewards of the business that are not tied to financial. I think one of your friends actually was the CEO of a dialysis uh, procedure that even saved his own life. Do you remember the story I'm talking about? Yeah, that's, that's George Rathman. And uh, they developed a technique of dialysis. And George, kidneys went bad. And the product from his own company right, right. Saved, saved his life. And yeah. uh, George... Uh, eventually moved to Palo Alto and lived here for a long time. And I saw him from time to time, but he eventually died from his kidney problem, but not for a long time. And I say his life's maybe for a long 10 or 15 or 20 years, but the product developed in his own laboratories. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so, Pitch, talk a bit about, uh, before we end, end the session, talk a bit about what you're doing now. So I think that, you know, you mentioned selling some of these Divesting these stocks triggers a huge tax event for you. And so you're finding different ways to uh, have a positive impact. Well, over these years, I have developed a portfolio of grown up venture capital companies. They virtually all have zero or very close to zero cost basis. So um, I, the number is not so big compared to some people, but for me and from my background, it's plenty big. So I'm, I have a group of um, about five people. We have a CFO. We have a, uh, a venture, um, venture capital associate, very strong guy. And then we have um, a, a controller. And uh, we have a, somebody who who's my, acts as my assistant but, but is very much involved in some other purchasing. And then we have a woman that runs our, we have a foundation and a woman runs that foundation. And this group of people uh, with a few, couple of helpers more, um, looks after this money. We don't, but, but what we do is we sell, we sell things when we need some money. That's a very expensive thing to do. So we make our, uh, uh, we do quite a bit of charitable contributions and we do that with, with a stock. And we, we tell people that if you want us to invest in, in your charity or your community activity, you've got to be able to accept stock and almost everybody does. And so- and the, Does that trigger a tax event when you transfer ownership of the stock to the charitable foundation or, or does it not because it's a charity? Well, if, if we, if we put money in our foundation, it's not a tax event. Uh, there's some rules about what you do with the money after you get there. You gotta, you gotta invest. Uh, but we don't put a lot of money in ahead of the time we need it. So our foundation 
uh, it gives cash to a whole number of things every year. And so we give the foundation ca uh, stock, it sells the stock, and that's not a tax event, and gives, gives, gives the money away almost immediately. So we don't have a lot of capital in that company. And if we did, there'd be more problems having to do with the amount you have to distribute. So then we also, we support things like San Francisco Opera, a major thing for us, and we give them stock directly and they, they, they sell it and there's no tax cost to us because there's, there's a charitable use of the money. It's, it's like giving, so we, but we don't have to pay taxes because you couldn't afford to do what you do if you had to pay taxes and then give away cash after the taxes. It just would be impossible. Hmm. So um, the IRS or the government's rules are that you can do this. We follow the, we follow the rules very, very carefully so we don't don't want IRS problems and don't have them. <laughs> Good for you. That's the way you like it. And um, with asset management company, I know you've stepped down from daily operations, but that's still actively investing. Or, uh, well, the, the name of our venture firm, which goes way back, is called Asset Management Ventures. Okay. And, and I, I'm um, uh, I've been investing in that, although it's been making pretty good money over the years. But um, three guy, I have three guys, a generalist, a uh, cardiologist, and a guy who is an expert, computer expert. And those three guys run that company and make the investments. And I don't, I, 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 for a while I had veto power, but I, because I'm the primary investor in that, my wife mm -hmm. and I, and maybe a few others. And so that's called Asset Management Ventures. And he has offices separate from ours. It operates separately. We, we see those guys pretty often. But the uh, the, the cardiologist is uh, uh, Lu Lang is a very strong doctor, and he, so he he sort of runs the medical side of it, which is the main thing they do. And they 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 tend to do uh, medical deals which have a computer side to them. So uh, and they they've been doing fine. They just started a new fund. Uh, of about 25 million, of which I made a substantial part of that. But they raised money from outside for that fund, uh, and they they they're still still talking to people. They just, just now raised it, so I I made a substantial. My wife and I made a substantial personal investment in that fund, and uh, let's say I hope it does well. <laughs> okay, well, if past performance is a prognosis for the future, it'll do it'll do just fine. And but what, um, what do you look for in an investment opportunity? If you were to share that, you know, kind of perspective with VCs out there and entrepreneurs seeking to raise capital, what are some of the core things you look for when making an early stage investment into a startup? Well, I think the quality of the person is number one. If I meet with a person, a man or a woman, and I feel these guys have integrity, they have skill, they will work hard to try to make this happen. They're not afraid of they're not afraid of risk and failure because you, you can't get people that are, are afraid of things. So I say the number one is the person, uh, the man or woman, and their quality as a person. Number two, and, and by the way, Don Valentine, my now deceased friend, mm. always argued with. We'd be on panels and argue about this all day. He said that you can change the people, but oh. you can't. You, you, but I think it's, you say, I think it's market. Well, I agree to a certain extent. I think it is, I think the number two thing is, is the market you're serving. And number three is the product that you're using to serve the market. And, and sometimes you can create a market when one doesn't exist, of which um, Steve Jobs was brilliant at that. He right. created markets that didn't exist before he served them. Um, and so those three things, people, markets products and then of course finance comes in the uh, what 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 do you need you, you can't have so little money that you can't do all those things so there's those four elements are what i look for coming together to build a good company and i built some that for the, but mostly it's because the leader was strong now we've changed presidents a couple of times and don valentine was, was good at that or so uh, 
I miss Don, by the way. He's a very fine venture capitalist, a very fine person. Yeah. And I, I just miss him personally from, from working with him uh, many times. Sure. Well, he's he's an icon, Don Valentine. The uh, I think in a world of a lot of startups start off with one plan and then find themselves changing tact and pivoting. And in a world of pivots where things are changing and there's experimentation happening, what you're definitely left with is the management team and the people. And if the market they were going after was a big market and the tech can be repurposed, um, betting on betting on the person is is definitely a key component to, in my experience. You have well. to change direction sometimes. And um, I like the a manager who comes to the board and says, here's what I want to do. And I don't like a manager who comes and says, here's three things I can do. Which one should I do? I don't right, like right, that. Right, right, right. Sure. And that, that's happened to me uh, several times. And I lost a lot of confidence by an, by an entrepreneur saying that to the board. I can imagine. And so parting, parting advice for the next generation or current generation of venture capitalists that, that are operating in the industry. I mean, maybe you already gave us some of your feelings about these large, large funds that are in it for the money, that it's not a passion play. Um, but what advice would you give to venture capitalists like myself or others? Well, I would say my, my view is more narrow than some, but the exciting thing about venture capital is building companies. Now you can do it with lots of money, you can do it with small amounts for a while, but have a plan to build a company and, and uh, create fine companies, both large and small, for your activity. And, and think about building a company more than you think about the immediate ability to turn the money over. I'd say that's the main thing that I, I, I look for. I'm, I'm not doing that now myself, Although even in our little in our little family office, we've helped help start three companies, <laughs> and okay. uh, and and because they did, we always offer them to the venture capital guys. But these are little deals that we hope will build build up something, um, build up someday. But um, I think my thing is think of building companies as the fundamental job you have, and that will guide you to more satisfaction for yourself. And can certainly lead to making a lot of money if you find the right deals to do. Sounds like sound advice. Well, Pitch, it was a great honor. Thank you so much for making time for us. And I hope some of these companies get a operational vaccine soon and we can all uh, discuss these old stories in the real world. Okay, well, I had a fun with this. I don't get to talk about myself too often. <laughs> okay, Pitch. <laughs> have a great time. Thank you again. Bye for now. Bye.